see live streaming i think it started okay all right it started oh hi bill yeah hi <laughs> good to see you okay bill koblenz is a a wpi graduate uh and uh, uh spent many years at uh, darpa anyway <laughs> glad you can join at short notice oh my play is like being back in school <laughs> great Here. Okay. Oh. Uh, okay. So. Okay. Um. I guess we can uh, get it started. So. Uh, hi, everyone. Um. So today. Um. Uh. We will have our uh, regular seminar. So before we start. I want to share with you of uh, uh, my screen uh, about the schedule, right? The schedule of uh, uh, this uh, the the remaining talks in this uh, term. So let me do that. Share screen. So I hope everyone can see the screen. Um, so basically, uh, today uh, we have uh, Professor Paul. Uh, to give us a talk. And uh, uh, in next week, we have uh, Professor Tarn Turner uh, give us uh, uh, his uh, second talk. I really appreciate the help from him. And uh, the week after that, it will be the uh, students from uh, CRQ to give us uh, uh, the talks. So uh, we haven't fixed uh, how many students actually will give a talk. So hopefully, two or th three students uh, will do that. And um, the arrangement so far is that is uh, that will pretty much the last seminar we will have. The reason for that is uh, May 13th uh, is the last day of uh, uh, the D term. So probably a lot of students uh, uh, working on their uh, final exam don't have time uh, to work on that. So temporarily, Possibly uh, we will um, uh, cancel this uh, uh, last uh, seminar. So uh, yeah, so the, the seminar on uh, May 6th probably will be the last seminar we will have. Mm -hmm. If there's any change update, I will let you know. Okay. Uh, okay, so um, I guess we can uh, get it uh, started. So uh, today it is our uh, Great pleasure again. You know, thanks for the help from uh, uh, Professor Paul. That he he's uh, giving uh, two courses in this uh, term, but he still uh, squeezed his time out uh, to give us the seminar. So the uh, the topic will be about the efficient zero emissions uh, production of solar, silicon, and uh, magnesium. Uh, okay, so Professor Paul, it's all yours. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, if you could uh, just enable and just share my screen. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so many things I forgot. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Great. Okay. Uh, share and, whoops, darn it. Uh, does this work? Yes. Okay. Uh, terrific. Well, uh, uh, thank you, um, uh, you for the uh, invitation. It's uh, it's good to be here. And uh, we'll say that uh, he mentioned that although I'm teaching two classes, I, I'm taking the time to do this. Uh, th this was uh, originally a, a, a talk uh, for uh, TMS. So um, uh, so those of you who are at TMS uh, may have seen uh, seen some of this. This was in the Electrometallurgy Symposium and a tribute to Don Sadoway, uh, his 70th birthday. I'll talk about him in just a moment. I just noticed this morning uh, that uh, today is Earth Day, so happy Earth Day to, uh, to everyone, and I hope that this, uh, this talk will be in the, in the theme in terms of uh, silicon and magnesium production and recycling technology for uh, clean energy, uh, energy efficiency, energy storage, and some new uh, new and uh, hopefully interesting uh, uses of, uh, of these in, in, uh, in transportation. So first, uh, this, as I mentioned, this was a tribute to Don Sadoway. He's a, a, a professor at MIT. 
uh, mentor over many years. And um, uh, yeah, he, uh, he really influenced me in a lot of different ways, uh, not the least of which that, uh, is that when I was uh, in graduate school in the, in the uh, 1990s, uh, he um, uh, was doing a lot of work on the, the Hall Hero cell for aluminum production. Uh, since then, he has uh, uh, done um, uh, that, uh, basically taken that process and uh, used it as a um, uh, new method for um, uh, for producing uh, iron with uh, zero emissions, zero emissions iron making. He calls it molten oxide electrolysis, and also a an energy storage uh, method uh, for for uh, called liquid metal batteries. Uh, so uh, a lot of um, uh, a lot of different innovations around the themes of you know, electrochemistry, uh, molten salts uh, among them, uh, but not not exclusively, and uh, also a technology change important to society. Uh, so um, let's see. Um, let's go. There we go. So uh, I'll be talking about silicon and magnesium. In terms of uh, solar silicon, uh, this, uh, there's a constant drive to lower the costs of uh, photovoltaic mo uh, modules for solar energy. And in particular, the last 10 years have seen an amazing uh, reduction in price uh, that um, uh, uh, 10 or 11 years ago, when the, um, uh, the stimulus under Obama first came out and we were putting some money into renewable energy, there was this dream that someday you know, we, we might reach uh, one dollar per watt of um, uh, of cost of, of photovoltaics. Well, uh, you know, the the, uh, uh, the cost curve very quickly you know, dropped, and um, you know, we we saw uh, last year about thirty three cents uh, per watt, and uh, a clear vision uh, toward achieving uh, even. Um, as low as 18 cents uh, per watt of, um, of you know, cost of photovoltaic modules uh, by 2025. And uh, an important piece of this is the um, uh, silicon. Uh, so um, uh, so uh, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, consistently been uh, somewhere around 15% uh, or so of the cost of photovoltaics uh, for, for the last uh, you know, 10, 15 years or so, with the exception of a, of a a scarcity driven spike in um, uh, in um, uh, 2007 but um, uh, as the other components get uh, get more and more uh, uh, you know, efficient and, and less costly uh, you know, silicon becomes a main uh, a, a driver for price in the future uh, so uh, that's the motivation uh, for this project is uh, you know, basically kind of extreme reduction in the cost of, of solar silicon so uh, the process vision is based on the Hall Hero cell, uh, which uh, uh, might make sense as as uh, Don Sadaway was a mentor. Um, but um, uh, in this uh, process, we hope to achieve one step uh, production of uh, solar silicon directly from quartzite right out of the ground. Uh, so in aluminum production, uh, the raw material uh, costs uh, about uh, 300 to $500 per ton and is about 99.5% aluminum oxide with the remainder mostly sodium. And that's uh, you know, the result of a, a, uh, a chemical process to uh, digest bauxite and make uh, uh, pure alumina. Uh, for silicon, the raw material uh, comes out of the ground at, uh, you know, with, with some very simple mechanical processing at 997 to 99.9% .9 purity. So better uh, starting purity and at lower costs, about 120 bucks a ton, uh, just uh, because you only know, need to do that simple processing. So why not try to uh, make a um, uh, do a one-step um, uh, process to uh, directly uh, reduce uh, silicon dioxide uh, to um, uh, silicon by electrolysis? Just uh, you know, feed the uh, uh, SiO2 and uh, you know, produce uh, silicon at the at the cathode. Silicon does not exist as plus four ions in the molten salt. This is just a, a kind of a cartoon or a schematic. But, and then at the other side, uh, produce oxygen gas. Now this oxygen gas production was, um, uh, has been the work of Uday Paul uh, using this, this uh, it was called a, a solid oxide membrane anode, uh, which basically chemically draws the oxide ions out of the molten salt uh, through a, a, a yttria stabilized zirconia membrane. That's about a two or three millimeter thick 
uh, in membrane or closed, closed tube of zirconia. And the reason it's really important here for silicon is that if you try to use a carbon anode, uh, you, you get CO2 bubbling and that's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a sustainability thing, but much more important uh, that CO2 uh, becomes uh, carbonate ions in the bath and that gets reduced at the cathode to uh, silicon carbide. So you're not making uh, silicon, you're making silicon carbide and not very good silicon carbide. It's, you know, it's a you know, multi-crystalline, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's you know, a complex uh, topic. But um, so others have had this type of vision before and many have, have tried it, um, but have, have not uh, succeeded. Uh, so uh, what's different now is a bath composition invented by Uday Paul at Boston University. Uh, I mentioned that, uh, that uh, he was the, he's the one that's been the pioneer of, of the um, uh, zirconia. In addition, he came up with this uh, molten salt, uh, with, um, uh, which is much better on, you know, uh, about an order of magnitude better on, on five different metrics than anything that's come before. Uh, so this has gotten me excited and, uh, about uh, working on using this to, to do electrolysis. So just to kind of walk through this, um, uh, this molten salt composition. Uh, so, so it begins with uh, you know, calcium fluoride and magnesium fluoride. Uh, these are you know, extremely low vapor pressure, uh, very stable um, molten salts. Uh, they're, they're transparent as well. Uh, they're you know, transparent, not just in the, the visible, but all the way from you know, far infrared to uh, ultraviolet. And they have a nice um, eutectic uh, at about 970 uh, Celsius, roughly 50-50 um, uh, magnesium fluoride to calcium fluoride uh, mole, mole ratio. Uh, it's a very wide electrochemical stability window. Uh, the calcium and magnesium ions are extremely stable. Uh, fluorine, of course, you know, extremely stable and uh, have relatively high solubility for a lot of oxides. Uh, the next addition here is yttrium fluoride. Uh, that's something which um, uh, Uday discovered uh, stabilizes yttria stabilized zirconia. Uh, without this, the yttria, yttrium oxide in the zirconia uh, leaches out and that um, uh, both um, uh, reduces the, the conductivity and also leads to, um, uh, to you know, uh, rapid uh, uh, erosion, uh, corrosion of the, of the zirconia, rapid dissolution. But if you add yttrium fluoride uh, to the bath, then um, uh, you can you, know, you can stabilize the you know, yttria and the zirconia, and um, uh, the, the activity coefficients work well. That the um, uh, zirconia is about eight mole percent uh, yttria, which is uh, you know, somewhere around fifteen weight percent or so, but only uh, you know, two to four weight percent yttrium fluoride in the bath. Uh, makes it stable uh, where, where there's you know, equilibrium and uh, no leaching at all, no, no uh, motion of yttria out. And so a uh, very long lifetime of the zirconia. Uh, silicon dioxide is what we want to dissolve in here. And I um, uh, actually worked on uh, silicon production about 10 years ago uh, in my startup company, Infinium. It was one of the first, uh, uh, first things that we worked on uh, in this. And, um, uh, and we found very quickly that uh, uh, silicon, when you add silica to this molten salt bath, you very quickly make silicon fluoride, uh, SIF4. And that's a gas uh, that, that bubbles out. It actually boils at minus 60 Celsius. So it's a gas at room temperature. And um, uh, that was a problem. Uh, so uh, Uday came up with this idea that I thought was crazy at the beginning. Uh, let's add calcium oxide. And so you know, I, I, the way I thought about it was Le Chatelier's principle says that if you want to increase the solubility of one oxide, you shouldn't add, add another oxide, right? And calcium is already there. But if you add calcium oxide, that should decrease the solubility of the silicon dioxide, right? Well. He, uh, he, he said, uh, you know, trust me on this. And um, uh, sure enough, his chemical metallurgy experience from the steel industry uh, proved correct. And uh, we were actually in, uh, able to um, uh, increase the, uh, the solubility of silicon, uh, of SiO2 to 5% and, and beyond at, at higher temperatures with extremely low uh, solubility of the SiF4. So this is a real breakthrough in molten salt uh, chemistry. 
Uh, in addition, beyond the uh, yttrium fluoride, the calcium oxide adjusts something called the optical basicity, uh, which uh, it's, it's a whole le uh, lecture all on its own, but uh, it uh, makes the, um, uh, the zirconia more stable in this, uh, in this molten salt bath. So uh, this, uh, with this uh, molten salt chemistry breakthrough, I think uh, this is the time to be uh, working on a new, new process for molten salt electrolysis of silicon. So uh, the process of vision uh, is based on um, uh, using either, either slab cathodes of silicon or cylindrical cathodes. This shows uh, slab cathodes. This is some CAD work by an undergraduate MQP team from chemical engineering. It's uh, Surat Buasai and, um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Alex McMahon, E.J. Wu. They also did some modeling work. And um, uh, so I should say also, these, these first slides are adapted from um, a talk at TMS by, um, uh, by Aditya Amudgal, who is a PhD student working on this project in, in my group. Uh, so the idea is uh, we, we put in um, uh, multiple of these uh, zirconia uh, tube uh, anodes uh, here. And, um, uh, and uh, in between them, uh, slabs of, of silicon. Uh, so an actual cell might look uh, more, some, more like something, something like on the left. And um, uh, so the, uh, the tubes are the anodes, again, withdrawing the, uh, the oxide ions. Uh, the silicon is the cathode, um, you know, you know, plating and, and depositing. Uh, but uh, uh, as I mentioned, it doesn't exist as SI4+. Plus. Uh, it actually exists as um, uh, SiO4, 4 minus, or uh, SI207, uh, what's that? Um, uh, I guess that's six minus, these complex ions of uh, silicon and oxygen uh, that um, uh, form you know, you know, monomers, dimers, uh, some polymers that increase the viscosity somewhat, although as, as mentioned in the, um, uh, in, the, in the previous slide, uh, yeah, the viscosity is, is uh, relatively low, uh, about five times that of water. So, uh, uh, so not like uh, when you think about silica, you think about glass, very high viscosity. So part of the process vision is switching and that's, um, uh, something that uh, uh, we're, we're going to try um, uh, where instead of having all of the cathodes being cathodic at all the time, you, you periodically switch uh, some of them. You, you throw, throw a switch, um, uh, to some, make some subset of them anodic so that the, uh, this becomes an anode uh, with current uh, to, um, uh, to the other uh, cathodes. And um, uh, if you change which subset you switch, uh, then most of the cathodes are, are uh, cathodic at all time, just some of them anodic, but you can put them on, on a large uh, uh, you know, 100,000 amp class uh, current bus uh, as you would have in a, a, a Hall Hero uh, cell uh, with, without having to you know, you know, switch the whole, whole bus uh, uh, in order to, to um, uh, you know, switch some uh, some cathodes some of the time, and this practice is borrowed from copper electro refining, uh, which which does this in aqueous solutions in order to um, you know, produce a a um, uh, you know, large uh, ingot of um, uh, of copper without dendrites. So the principle is basically, uh, as you uh, plate, you start to grow some roughness, and before you that that roughness grows into into dendrites, uh, you reverse the current. I make it anodic, and that quickly dissolves uh, the um, uh, the uh, the roughness, and then you you grow some more and dissolve, grow some more and dissolve, and in the copper industry, uh, they basically have a ratio of thirty to one uh, forward uh, to backward in time. So you run you know thirty times forward and then one time backward, and so you get about ninety four percent you know net uh, net forward current, three you know, percent back, and then you know another three percent to reverse. To undo the re reversal that you just did. Now, in molten salt, this really hasn't been done before for solid plating, and I think part of the reason is that um, uh, these are very high current cells. But another part is that, uh, unlike an aqueous solution where you have you know, a few ions surrounded by water molecules, in a molten salt, everything is an ion. So you have a very you know, much higher charge carrier density, and therefore have to you have much higher current density. 
you know, on the order of uh, you know, 30 times higher uh, current density for aluminum production versus copper electro refining. And uh, for, for that reason, you're gonna have to switch faster in order to avoid uh, roughness. Uh, so uh, looking at um, uh, with modern solid state switches, uh, what are the economics of kilohertz switching and uh, using that as an enabling technology, those switches have come down in cost uh, quite a lot uh, in the last 10 years uh, for, for things like you know, electric cars and grid, uh, you know, smart grid uh, switching, et cetera. So um, uh, we've done, uh, we, we've put together an experimental apparatus. This is uh, Aditya's um, uh, apparatus again, and we're getting ready to do experiments. And then of course the lab had to shut down. So, uh, so that's a, a work in progress. Nonetheless, the MQP team has done some preliminary calculations of uh, current density, which is uh, uh, useful for us in terms of looking at the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the design of the, the cathodes and uh, you know, what's the minimum size uh, cathodes uh, that we need, et cetera. Uh, and I'll talk briefly about an impurity content model. Uh, this, this uses the uh, butler volmer equation to uh, look at um, uh, the, the relative uh, plating densities of silicon and different impurities. So this uh, table here shows um, you know, silicon and a bunch of different uh, uh, impurities, uh, some of which are, are present in, uh, in silica and others of which just kind of you know, threw into the model uh, to, um, uh, to see you know, what is their, their effect, you know, just at uh, you know, 0.01%. And so um, uh, you know, we, we look at um, uh, you know, what is the, uh, the free energy of uh, reduction or free energy of formation of the oxide, if you will, uh, per mole of oxygen to, to look at which ones come out first uh, in, a, in a given you know, plating uh, operation. And so uh, you can see that the, the lower ones, you know, copper, of course, uh, comes out first. Uh, you know, there's uh, phosphorus, iron, uh, et cetera. Uh, but then we, we reorder this in terms of um, uh, you know, delta G per mole of, um, uh, of the metal. Uh, oh, well. And then we get the, uh, uh, the equilibrium, um, uh, the uh, voltage. Uh, so, this is a relatively simple model uh, based on lack of data. We assume, assume equal exchange current density. Uh, the, the electrochemists will know this, I won't get into it in detail. Compute the plating ratio and then uh, incrementally just remove that material from the bath, step forward in, in time and uh, just do this as a pure plating model without um, mass transfer or um, uh, ignoring also the uh, relative solubilities in, in silicon. Uh, and uh, you know, solution thermodynamics, et cetera. So uh, silicon is, is, um, uh, has very low solubilities of most of these with the exceptions of boron and phosphorus. So that alone will reject a lot of them. But just, just to kind of see what happens, we'll uh, look at um, uh, this model. So here are the results at uh, two different temperatures and two different voltages. And you can see that the, the first, uh, uh, first species to plate out is phosphorus. That's this pink one. And then the next one is um, uh, tin, uh, nickel, uh, uh, followed by um, uh, iron, um, uh, zinc, chromium, uh, et cetera, uh, and nickel I mentioned. And these all played out uh, preferentially before silicon. And as there's depleted, uh, you know, silicon rises toward uh, close to 100% of uh, the, the deposit as the, the others fall, as they are removed uh, from the molten salt. Uh, boron has, is very close to silicon in its, um, uh, its reduction potential. And um, uh, so if there's boron in the raw material, it will probably also be there in the, um, uh, in the product. And then as you get to, um, uh, to uh, higher temperatures and um, uh, higher voltages, this, uh, sorry, this is in the way here, um, but um, uh, darn it. Uh, higher voltages, uh, and things like um, uh, titanium and, um, uh, and uh, zirconium become important. As you can see titanium, but not zirconium here. Uh, so this you know, relative, uh, as simple a model as you can get of the, the electrochemistry, as I said, it really overstates the amount of impurities that, um, uh, that we'll get in because, they're, because of their low solubility in silicon. 
but um, uh, but it's a um, uh, it's a uh, conservative estimate. So what this also says is that you can start off uh, the process by uh, by plating onto a different cathode, like let's say onto a steel cathode, which is not selective the way silicon is, and just um, uh, get rid of of uh, a lot of these impurities at the front end uh, at the cost of only, you know, again, neglecting mass transfer, you know, only 1% um, uh, of the uh, uh, raw material lost. So it's a very, very small yield loss uh, for a very big gain in purity, uh, potentially, and even, even less at uh, lower temperature and lower voltage. I should say that this voltage is the, the, um, uh, the over potential right at the the cathode electrolyte interface. Uh, you'll have to apply a much larger voltage to the cell uh, to overcome the, um, the resistance of the molten salt and the zirconia, which has a very low uh, conductivity. Uh, so this is just the, uh, the plating voltage uh, you know, potential right there at, that, uh, at the interface there. Okay, uh, so um, next steps to continue uh, model development, uh, you know, more, more transport modeling. We open the lab and do some baseline experiments, uh, add, add stirring. Uh, one of the things, one of the problems that we'll have to deal with is that um, uh, whereas a carbon anode has CO2 driven, uh, in bubble driven stirring, uh, zirconia does not. And so we'll have to add some, some other form of stirring, we have a couple of ideas, and then add the, uh, the switching as well. Uh, so this is an exciting area of, of, uh, of research. Uh, uh, I think the, the undergrads have done a terrific job and Aditya is making us some rap rapid progress uh, as we speak. Well, maybe not at this moment, but anyway. Uh, the next uh, topic I'll talk about is um, magnesium. Ah, sorry, one more thing uh, to mention here. Uh, the undergrads have done a, a nice uh, cost model which shows an operating cost of about uh, $2 per kilogram of, of silicon. Uh, so that's about 80% um, uh, uh, lower than today's uh, price of, of uh, pure silicon for, uh, for, um, uh, for um, uh, photovoltaics and comparable to the cost of, of doing this in a, a giant um, uh, in, uh, carbothermic uh, reduction furnace, which produces uh, uh, the world's silicon today. That produces silicon at 98% purity, uh, which then has to be you know, refined. Uh, so we don't yet know the purity of this, but it, will, it should be at least the purity of the raw material at 99.7, uh, 99.8% 99 uh, pure. So um, uh, a higher purity, uh, very low cost, uh, it could reduce the cost of solar silicon uh, quite a bit. Uh, so that doesn't include the capital cost, it's just the operating cost, but that's a uh, you know, cost modeling issue for another day. So uh, for magnesium, uh, magnesium hull has has uh, also been a dream of many, uh, but um, uh, for, for years, but there are a couple of problems that have come up. One of them is a uh, low density. So the hull heros cell works because liquid aluminum sits at the bottom of the cell, and builds up and has higher density than the molten salt. It took a while to find a, a uh, molten salt that, that worked uh, in this way. Uh, but um, uh, so this, this cryolite of sodium fluoride and aluminum fluoride uh, you know, works, works well um, uh, anyway. Uh, magnesium is a problem because there is no molten salt uh, less dense than magnesium. You're not even beryllium fluoride. Uh, you know, lithium fluoride is considerably more, more dense. And so uh, if you tried to do a hull hero cell, you'd get sort of a lava lamp of you know, magnesium just floating up and uh, it just wouldn't work. Uh, another problem, which is more subtle, is that magnesium metal has some solubility in molten salts. And so it, it will dissolve into the salts uh, create some electronic conduction, which uh, short circuits the, um, uh, the the process as if there were a, uh, a, a you know, dendrite uh, you know, going through the molten salt. Uh, solution is a reactive liquid cathode. So this is a patent application filed in 1942 uh, using a, uh, a lead cathode. Uh, you could also, it also mentions tin or bismuth, and, uh, and that liquid lead uh, absorbs magnesium uh, that plates onto it and it diffuses in uh, very quickly. So it both uh, increases the, um, uh, the density and also um, uh, decreases the, um, 
the activity of the magnesium very dramatically. So it does not uh, dissolve into the molten salt. You can get uh, better current efficiency. So uh, this, this patent uh, 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 says, um, uh, hello, there we go. Uh, all you have to do then is uh, purify this, uh, this lead tin or, or this, this lead magnesium alloy and just uh, uh, you know, pump and return the, um, uh, the lead back into the uh, electrolytic cell. Uh, so uh, so uh, Mr. Yerk envisioned doing this as a continuous process. You can see the, the uh, little tweers here for uh, pumping in the lead and pumping out the lead, lead um, uh, magnesium alloy here. But that purification cell has been a, a, an issue. And he talks about uh, distillation. And you, you can distill magnesium out of uh, other, uh, other uh, materials, but, um, uh, but that's a problem. So, so this is just the magnesium lead thermodynamics uh, showing that um, uh, you know, we, we have a, um, uh, uh, there's a you know, very strong uh, att attraction here that uh, magnesium and tin actually form a, a um, uh, a line compound with a higher melting point than either one of them. Uh, this is in Kelvin, so it's about 770 uh, Celsius. And um, uh, you know, that strong attraction leads to a very low uh, activity coefficient. So um, uh, you can have you know, 50 mole uh, percent magnesium with just um, uh, five, uh, you know, 0.05 activity. Uh, so, so this, uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, it absorbs the magnesium and, and you know, basically binds to it very tightly with very low activity. So it will not go into the molten salt as a metal and uh, lead, to, um, uh, lead to conduction. Uh, so, um, but as mentioned that um, uh, yeah, distillation step can work, but it's very expensive and very energy intensive. Uh, the um, uh, enthalpy of vaporization of magnesium is about 1.5 kilowatt hours per kilogram, but uh, distillation uses about uh, you know, six to 10 kilowatt hours per kilogram. It's, it's very, very energy intensive. And it's expensive also because when you make your, um, uh, your magnesium, it's, it's, uh, magnesium has a very high uh, vapor pressure at its melting point. It's you know, second maybe only to chromium. Um, there's one other like thulium or something like that. But um, uh, so it's, it's very hard to get uh, magnesium as a liquid in a distillation process. So you get uh, magnesium solid and when it condenses, it condenses as a crown, which is very porous. If you try to open it at high temperature, you get a, a magnesium uh, air explosion, uh, just you know, bad news. So you have to wait for the, the, the distillation process to run in a batch and then wait for it to cool down. And the cycle time is, is anywhere from six to 24 hours. So you get very low capital utilization, very expensive uh, batch, uh, batch process. Uh, so uh, what to do about that? Well, um, uh, vapor compression uh, distillation is one idea. Uh, could be used. And the, uh, the, the idea behind vapor compression distillation is that you take the uh, enthalpy of uh, condensation and um, uh, use that uh, to provide uh, the, enth the, the enthalpy to the evaporator and, uh, and, and you know, evaporate your, your material using that energy. So this, this is great and it sounds like a perpetual motion machine. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's not, the, the energy is uh, provided um, by a compression, as, as the name implies, that you compress the vapor so that the pressure in the a condenser is higher than that in the evaporator. Therefore, the boiling point in the condenser is higher than the boiling point in the evaporator. And the hotter condenser can uh, transfer heat to the cooler evaporator without uh, violating laws of thermodynamics. So this is a, a really nice process. Uh, the chemical engineers have optimized it so that you can do water vapor compression distillation using, uh, using an amount of energy equivalent to only 2% of the enthalpy of vaporization. So this is a very, very efficient uh, distillation uh, process. Uh, so uh, at, at the startup Infinium, we actually achieved vapor compression distillation of magnesium metal. Uh, this is a, a, a technically uh, difficult feat. Uh, we had an ARPA-E award that we ran for one, just over one kilogram per hour for five hours. So at a decent, uh, uh, decent size lab scale, 
the steady state energy just below two kilowatt hours per kilogram. So this is close to the vaporization uh, enthalpy of, of uh, magnesium. It's a pretty neat process. Uh, had to some complex thermo, uh, thermal models that we, we validated, uh, some really nice work by someone named David Dussault, uh, who gave the mechanical engineering seminar um, about a month and a half ago, no, two months ago, two and a half, anyway, <laughs> sometime earlier this year, uh, he gave a mechanical engineering de department seminar, uh, talking about uh, various uh, uh, you know, phase change processes and their applications. So at Infinium, we used David's models to design a uh, compact, continuous vapor compression distiller for magnesium, uh, making about uh, on the order of 500 tons per year. And based on our validated thermal models, this should achieve a, an energy use of 0.6 kilowatt hours per kilogram. So 60% lower than the, um, the vaporization enthalpy of magnesium. This can be used either for recycling or for primary production of, uh, of magnesium. And uh, recycling is straightforward and primary production basically builds on that patent that I just mentioned. To take uh, something like a hall hero pot line of uh, magnesium uh, with uh, you know, fluoride bath, magnesium oxide, uh, you know, I ideally with these uh, inert anodes, these solid oxide membrane anodes using uh, zirconia. And um, uh, you know, starting with a, um, uh, something like a 90-10 uh, weight percent alloy, you, you uh, run the electrolysis, add magnesium until the, um, uh, the magnesium gets up to uh, you know, the same amount as the tin, 50-50. Uh, alloy, which is uh, uh, by weight, which is 83 uh, mole percent magnesium, then do vapor compression distillation to take out the magnesium uh, and get back to a uh, you know, 90-10 uh, ratio. And um, in terms of the, uh, the economics of this, this hall hero uh, system, uh, magnesium has lower enthalpy of uh, formation of the oxides. So you should be able to run uh, at, uh, a comparable voltage but more importantly, the rate is 50% higher by mole for magnesium because you only have to transfer two electrons from mag instead of three. And uh, by mass, it's about 33% uh, uh, higher than, than aluminum. So you can have a, a, a production cell, which is um, you can take an aluminum pot line, you know, an aluminum plant, uh, you just uh, substitute this uh, different raw material and get um, uh, get one third more magnesium, uh, which is more valuable. And um, so this, this raises, you know, could, could we uh, you know, get this uh, having, a, uh, could we make magnesium for less than the cost of aluminum? Uh, so this is a potential project uh, you know, costs less and the part weight is lower. So the cost of a given part of magnesium uh, metal would be uh, lighter, uh, you can get better strength to weight uh, ratio in, in parts as well. So this is uh, this is uh, pretty exciting. Uh, if we can scale up this vapor compression distillation uh, of, of magnesium. So what are some applications? I mentioned energy efficiency. Uh, Ford and Magna collaborated on a, um, a vehicle design. Uh, just you know. In, Given um, uh, what we think uh, will be available in 2025, uh, this was a uh, final uh, vehicle out of uh, in order to um, uh, minimize the, the weight of the whole vehicle. So uh, looking at, um, uh, I think I, I, my internet connection is stable, so I'm going to see if I can um, uh, switch to, um, uh, uh, switch to audio. Um, Darn it, I don't see an easy way to do that here. Uh, okay, uh, anyway, um, let me just open the chat so that I can, uh, so let me know if, uh, darn it, where's the chat? Come on, chat. Oh well, uh, anyway, um, uh, so, yeah, so, so this exercise, they came up with a vehicle that was uh, pretty mag uh, magnesium intensive uh, with magnesium sheet exterior, uh, magnesium seat frames, uh, uh, almost all magnesium closures. Uh, those are the you know, doors and the hatches, uh, et cetera. Uh, so uh, you can see, see these, these doors are, are mostly magnesium. And also uh, 
uh, cast magnesium uh, subframe uh, components and are able to achieve a 50% uh, weight reduction uh, versus their, their steel uh, baseline. So uh, the, uh, the barriers to achieving this, uh, sorry, I'm just gonna keep the chat window. Uh, oh, oh, darn it. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, I'm gonna keep, keep the chat window open though. Let me know if you have, uh, have trouble hearing me. Uh, barriers to achieving this are uh, uh, primary production cost um, and uh, uh, recycling of, uh, of magnesium, welding and corrosion. So I mentioned um, uh, in primary production costs could be considerably lower. Uh, recycling as well could use vapor compression distillation. And for weld corrosion, working on a project together with uh, Brajendra Mishra, uh, postdoc uh, Kubra Karaikis, and uh, Ching Li Ding is a PhD student, uh, along with the PNNL Oak Ridge and Magna on addressing weld corrosion. Uh, so. Um, if all goes well, we could have magnesium aluminum uh, structures in, in vehicles in, in, in somewhere between uh, you know, uh, model year uh, 2025 or, or, or later, depending on uh, how, how quickly we can address uh, these, these barriers, uh, how quickly these, these uh, projects move forward. So pretty exciting stuff. But uh, I think um, uh, at least as exciting as magnesium for hydro energy storage uh, mechanism uh, because uh, you know, the, uh, the, the round trip efficiency of you know, production and, and use is, uh, is relatively high, not as high as batteries. Batteries can be around 80% you know, or so. Well, uh, for the battery, 80% uh, in a vehicle. Uh, hydrogen can be around 60% uh, you know, uh, based on you know, very efficient uh, electrolyzers and efficient fuel cells based on poly uh, uh, you know, polymer proton exchange membranes. So, um, so this is a, a neat use for, um, uh, for energy storage. And people were talking about using them for vehicles because hydrogen is lightweight, but then hydrogen storage isn't lightweight. Nonetheless, you can get low cost energy storage by making a slurry of magnesium powder in mineral oil. Uh, this is the work of a Massachusetts company called Safe Hydrogen. Uh, they're based in, in Fall River. And uh, this is what the, the, the slurry looks like. Uh, you, see, you can see uh, just from, from this, it's, it's um, you know, very uh, viscous. Uh, but um, uh, nonetheless, uh, you can uh, heat it up and get the hydrogen in and out uh, very efficiently. Uh, you, efficiently using a relatively little energy. So uh, you know, I think that batteries will probably be uh, lowest cost uh, for, um, uh, for you know, just uh, uh, for vehicles and uh, you know, up, to, up to heavy trucks even, you, know, you can look at um, yeah, the, the, Tesla, uh, the Tesla truck. Um, but um, uh, for seasonal storage uh, from, uh, you know, that, that is you know, producing, uh, uh, solar energy in the summer and, uh, and using it in the winter, uh, this could be a very attractive option. Uh, also for something like uh, shipping, uh, this could be, uh, be helpful where you're not as concerned about the weight as you are in a vehicle or, or uh, uh, something like an aircraft. Um, you could also uh, envision, um, uh, yeah, slurry, mineral oil, okay a magnesium air uh, primary battery to power uh, ships and trains. So uh, you know, if, we, if we look at um, uh, just uh, you know, energy density uh, per, um, uh, per unit volume uh, versus per unit mass, hydrogen sounds great because it has this incredibly high energy per unit mass, but its energy per unit volume is very low. Uh, so uh, quite a bit lower uh, than, than hydrocarbons. Uh, you know, Jagan Jayachandran in the um, uh, aerospace program, he said to me once, you know, yeah, hydrogen is a, is a great fuel and carbon is a great way to, to store it. Uh, so, well, yeah, but we don't like the CO2 emissions. So lithium batteries are way down here. Uh, could we design a magnesium air uh, primary battery that's you know, not, not necessarily rechargeable? And um, uh, you know, even if your efficiency is, is 50%, uh, you still have a much, much better energy density uh, than lithium. 
Uh, then when you're done, you could take the magnesium oxide out of this battery uh, and, uh, uh, and just put it in this, uh, this uh, Halhero cell, make new ma magnesium efficiently and, and, uh, and cheaply. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, that's 50% uh, energy density refers to the battery. The overall round trip efficiency might be somewhere around 30% uh, you know, or so, but nonetheless, this could be a neat way to, uh, uh, to store energy at, uh, at high uh, energy density. Uh, per unit mass and uh, and per unit volume power ships and trains. So uh, I mentioned safe hydrogen. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, why not? Oh, yeah, okay. Let me just get into the economics just a little bit. Uh, so today, uh, renewable energy is cheaper than um, uh, than the price of uh, you know, coal-fired electricity, which is an amazing uh, thing to say. As, as I said about you know 10, 11, 12 years ago, this was a a you know, faraway dream that someday this might be the case in 20 or 30 or 40 years, and here we are today. Solar and wind are much cheaper than coal-fired elect electricity. Uh, it's you know, amazing progress in the last 10 years. But um, uh, in order to make this kind of battery economical, we have to go much further. That is, the renewable energy to produce the the magnesium plus the cost of converting that energy to magnesium must be uh, less than the cost of the really cheap bunker oil that they use, which is basically what's left over in a refinery after you've taken out all the good stuff. It has lots of, uh, lots of uh, sulfur, all kinds of other impurities. Uh, so that's a tall order. Hopefully the renewable energy continu can continue to get cheaper. The magnesium uh, or other metal uh, you know, conversion efficiency can continue to get better and this can become a, uh, a reality. So um, uh, if, um, uh, if you know, battery is good, then, then why not take safe hydrogen's uh, slurry and just burn the whole thing in a, uh, an aerospace fuel? Uh, so this is a magnesium hydrocarbon slurry that is pumpable, uh, stable in air. Uh, this is a project that I'm working on with Jagan uh, Jayachandran, who I mentioned, um, uh, and um, uh, you know this, uh, uh, you can make a slurry of one micron powders, uh, one one micron uh, mag hydride powders uh, at um, uh, about 300 Celsius. These will burst and release hydrogen. So as the hydrocarbon is evaporating, these will burst, uh, creating much finer magnesium uh, particles. These nanoparticles which should burn in the vapor phase. That is, the magnesium should evaporate um, before it burns, giving you an extremely fine magnesium oxide uh, powder as a, uh, your particles as a, uh, an exhaust. So if you, you have a, a slurry with something like jet fuel, uh, you'll, you'll get um, the CO2 and water from the hydrocarbon combustion, but also this magnesium oxide and additional water from the, the magnesium hydride that was released early on. So, um, uh, so th those will come out of the engine, and then after exiting, that magnesium oxide should react with CO2 from the engine or from the atmosphere to make uh, magnesium carbonate, uh, which then falls to the ground as uh, as magnesium carbonate rain. So uh, you solve the well, you should end up with a net uh, zero or potentially net negative uh, greenhouse gases, but we don't know the uh, the impact of this magnesium carbonate uh, rain on watersheds. So the, um, uh, you know that uh, magnesium is, is very non-toxic. Uh, you know, we, we drink magnesium hydroxide for upset stomach and you can get magnesium oxide dust into your lungs. It dissolves and it's a bodily nutrient. Uh, but what will be the effect of this on, um, on watersheds or in particular, you know, highly concentrated uh, you know, areas like around airports, et cetera. So there are lots and lots of questions uh, to, to ask here. Um, but uh, that said, one question that has been answered by the, uh, the calculations of an undergrad uh, named uh, Yi Jie Wu uh, working on this is um, that uh, uh, if you look at the um, uh, aircraft range using the range equation, uh, it takes more mass of this, this slurry uh, than of, um, uh, of uh, um, uh, what do you call it, of, of you know, traditional hydrocarbon fuel to get to a certain range, but less volume. So the same uh, fuel tank um, can uh, get to uh, a, um, uh, you know, if this is our, um, 
uh, our you know, hydrocarbon baseline, uh, the same volume of liquid hydrogen gets nowhere near as far because of its low, low uh, volumetric uh, energy, energy density. Uh, you could try a, um, a fuel cell, but fuel cells weigh 10 times as much as jet engines uh, per, per unit thrust, and that would get you maybe up to here or so. Uh, this magnesium hydride uh, slurry uh, does slightly better uh, than um, uh, in between five and 10% better in terms of the range than your, your hydrocarbon fuel. So that's, that's one, uh, one thing that's uh, you know, less, uh, not, not going to be a, a problem here. You get the, the same kind of high uh, range. So um, uh, now we, we've got some on order. We're going to burn it and, uh, uh, and uh, study the reaction kinetics. So um, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, you know, you know, potential showstoppers. We, we've looked at the range. Uh, next is the combustion thermodynamics kinetics. Uh, we're blasting magnesium oxide particles into the jet engine turbine. And although they're small particles, uh, you know, we, We'll see what happens. Uh, the cold spray people may have something to say about uh, you know, what happens when you blast a fine powder onto a substrate, right? Uh, what are the atmospheric reaction kinetics? Uh, and um, yeah, will there be, uh, yeah, will these fine particles reflect visible uh, solar energy back out? Uh, that would be great. Or will they react, re reflect infrared uh, energy back down to the ground, which would be bad. Uh, will they nucleate raindrops and change the water balance in the atmosphere? Uh, as I mentioned, localized impacts near, impact, near airports, uh, uh, impacts on land and watershed. And uh, yeah, this will cost billions of dollars to, uh, to redesign an, an engine and possibly an aircraft around uh, this fuel. Uh, so um, uh, is it a crazy idea? Well, uh, we've, we've uh, you know, resolved a couple of the show stops, stoppers favorably. Uh, and uh, we'll see how far we can go. So um, yeah, given what's at stake, we have to try everything. So looking at uh, these difficult fossil fuel emissions, uh, aviation and shipping and, and road transport are some things that may be able to address using low cost magnesium. Uh, also um, uh, you know, vehicles as well, making them lighter. Electricity, uh, uh, solar silicon could, uh, uh, could be improved and load following electricity, that's, that's another matter. Uh, so uh, we have to do all that we can uh, using electrometallurgy to find as many solutions as possible. So acknowledge the, um, uh, the grants that made this possible, uh, the Department of Energy through uh, Solar Energy and Vehicle Technologies grants here at WPI and the ARPA-E grant that made the vapor compression distillation possible, the new NSF grant also on um, uh, solar silicon and knowledge again, my mentor, Don Sadaway. So uh, thanks very much. Uh, I don't know if uh, you have any time for questions. Uh, students don't have to walk to their next class, but uh, I'll let uh, you decide that uh, you, uh, uh, in terms of what's next, uh, Professor Zhang. Oh, I'll mention okay. also Professor yeah. Zhang is All right. okay. Thank you very so much. Much. Yeah, so uh, of course, yeah, there, there will maybe some student need to attend the uh, other courses, but at this, is, everything is online. So probably most students, if they're interested, can still stay. So uh, right now, uh, I essentially muted everyone. Um, so for the students, if you have questions, you can raise your hand in Zoom, and then uh, I can unmute you. Uh, any questions to Professor Paul? Okay, so before before students actually raise their hands, uh, yeah, um, uh, I I actually uh, work on magnesium alloy a lot, so my yes. uh, PhD thesis is about magnesium, and I'm very interested in this uh, magnesium uh, work. Uh, so uh, my PhD thesis is about uh, use this in, like in the engine block, and uh, that will face a very high temperature, so uh, we people worry about the creep. Yeah, so that is uh, more or less very close uh, related to uh, your talk that like, uh, we want to use more and more magnesium <laughs> in uh, in automobile. Yeah, Absolutely. so this is yeah, very interesting. So hopefully we can, also very relevant. Yeah. yeah, we can um, write some uh, uh, proposal together because I have a collaborator also working on 
like the uh, compatibility of magnesium and aluminum in uh, automobile, you know, like uh, how to Absolutely. weld them uh, together. Yeah. And we'll have to study the uh, the thermodynamics of the molten salt oxide mixture as well. And that's another uh, specialty. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, of so course, that, uh, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, very, very nice talk. Very nice talk. Um, okay. Uh, any questions from students? Please raise your hand. All right. Looks like uh, most of the students uh, are fine with the uh, with your presentation, and there's uh, no uh, questions. Okay. Um, so with that, so Professor Powell, as I said, I will follow up with you uh, offline on the magnesium uh, research. Uh, other than that, I guess uh, we can uh, wrap up uh, today's uh, seminar. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for everyone uh, attending the seminar. Okay. So uh, see all of you in next week. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Goodbye.